Welcome to SciTech Culture with Steve Kern and Ben Warner, where we examine science, technology, and culture in the 21st century. Visit our website at scitechculture.com. You know, um, we've all had uh, bad days at the office. You know, sometimes we even, you know, manage to make the odd mistake or two in Photoshop. Steve, I'm sure you've been there. We've all been there. You know, with that blur filter didn't uh, quite work or the, you know, the gradiating, um, you know, some sort of uh, two layers together or whatever. But, um, you know, and as clickbaity as this uh, first topic is about um, Kate Middleton's scandal with her, you know, the doctored photo um, that it came out recently, is just, um, it's amusing on a variety of levels. Um, obviously, it's not amusing for her and the fact that she's probably getting blamed for it, even though that there was probably a team that um, was actually behind it and was, probably deserves the blame. But anyway, um, what I find funny about this particular topic is just um, the insanity that then sort of spurred out online. And, you know, obviously there's always been um, an hysterical interest in the British monarchy, you know, with, you know, you've got the English tabloids that followed them around and there's plenty of examples of where that's led to bad, <laughs> bad outcomes and all that sort of thing. But this is like just yet another example. But the thing maybe as a starting point on this topic is it's supercharged via social media and the amount of people doing TikToks analyzing the, um, you know, the, the photo and where it's gone wrong and um, then speculating as to why this was done in the first place and, and whatever. It could have just been that, you know, um, they, they, you know, when they were shooting it with a, with the pixel that gets, that lets you um, swap people, swap people's heads around, you know, the whole thing is like, they're all smiling together. And, you know, the, the joke being that, um, that we know it's fake because you can't get three kids to smile together at, at, at any one time <laughs> but um but i don't know i like to me that 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 is kind of like the crux of the interest in it for me that it was just so so supercharged and people are going nuts over it whereas it's probably just a simple um simple screw up um and then there's like this whole thing around oh they're not being transparent what's really going on why can't they just she just can't come out in public and explain what's going on even though as i understand she did like because she had surgery and had to be off for a couple of months or whatever and it's just crazy uh, it's i don't know it's, is it an emblematic of today's social media pumped society or something but it is been because we haven't seen her so i find this i find this a fascinating case of modernity so firstly there has to be something going on okay first rule of social media not that i've been on there for a long time but if you're alive you're posting something and in the modern uh socials it's all about photos so the fact that kate has not um posted any significant photo post this alleged surgery is significant. So you can make up a thousand reasons as to why I'm not going to speculate. The fact that she has not posted an image is significant. The fact that this not posting an image for so long has built up to viral proportions, people ask the questions and put pressure on and there was one very grainy, hard to see photo of her in the back of a limo preceding the fake or, or the adapted photograph, I should say. There's nothing fake about it. I'm sure it's all real. <laughs> they probably should have used the pixel because it probably would have given a better result. But, but, but Kate didn't piece together that image is the first thing because as, as bad as the errors were, it was still a professional job, kind of. And I don't know where we go to from there. What was the motivation for sending out a dodgy image? It's not a good look, and now it's just going to add to the speculation. I would have thought, and, and you know this as well, and we come from the real world of cinematography and image, even if she was sick, whatever was going on, you'd think it'd be pretty easy to sit her in a chair, 
in the garden or something like that, and I don't know, or get an image of her. So for some reason, she's gone quiet. Could just be a personal preference like mine. She's decided she's sick of it. But it could be something else, and that's what's driving the whole world mad. Well, two things on that. One, the first one, a side point. Um, given that all this posting that's going on to social media by everyone and them doctoring photos to make them look as great as what they can so you can look up a million bucks on um, Instagram or whatever, leave that aside as like that's the <laughs> what's going on most of the time anyway. It kind of then also highlights, um, I guess, the role of um, uh, the monarchy and individuals that are in that um, uh, are in that setup that they're kind of saddled with, um, you know, the fact that they're not, um, I guess the, there's words being labeled as being accountable because of um, their uh, public uh, position, you know, where, how they're getting funded, etc. And that um, it's um, not enough for, like, I, I wouldn't be surprised if, um, you know, she's just had enough and just wants to have a break for a, a couple of months or something. But that might not be a luxury that she can have in the position that she's in um, and in the sense that if they're um, part of that institution, like it all ha like it's so cr so ma managed to a micro level, you know, in terms of how they're perceived, where they're perceived, what they can and can't say, um, et cetera, et cetera, that that might be a component of it as well that's kind of um, aggravating the whole thing. Oh, I totally agree with you. I think I think that the royal family made it quite clear that Kate, when she had her surgery in January, whatever it was, they made it quite clear then she won't be back till after Easter. Now, I guess for the rest of us, all, all, all us normal people in the world, if we told our employer that, i.e. The, the public or whatever, I'm off on sick leave until then, probably everyone would accept it. And as long as you didn't start uh, posting photos of yourself in, uh, you know, a tropical beach in Thailand or something like that, you'd probably get away with it okay. Kate's done the reverse, probably thought, look, we haven't said anything or we've, we've said I won't be back till Easter and I'm going to take that time off, you know, like sick leave, like any, any uh, you know, workplace health and safety uh, team would, would the direction they would give you and she's taking her entitled <laughs> leave off <laughs> and it's backfired and then probably they've panicked and they've pulled together an artificial photograph a bit quickly and and now look at the mess they're in so it could be as simple as that i hope it is as simple as that but you know you, you can draw a direct comparison we've seen stars go missing who had very high profiles in the past and you know then you know they post a photo and everyone goes that wasn't taken then that's six months old and then they have to come out with a photo of them holding up today's paper, which in today's deep fake days anyway they they fake very easily these days. So you know this applies to anyone who has a huge social following and where there's interest. If you, if you don't validate your existence on social media as Kate hasn't for a for a month or two speculation is bound so it's it's fascinating this is real science technology and culture all bundled up into one and it just happens to be a story about cape uh middleton at the moment hmm, absolutely all right as much as i'd like to talk about this all day um we'll have to move on to our next topic which is still social media anyway and this is um facebook um basically angering the australian government with uh, plans to stop paying for news content They've done this or they've signaled this in Canada as well and probably, you know, wherever else they think um, it's uh, useful. Like they probably just think, well, it's not my, uh, not our, um, it's not profitable or it's not of interest to us in terms of um, whatever it is that, um, you know, suits their own interests. And, uh, you know, um, I don't know, like given the amount of power that they have, um, you know they could easily just pull the platform like they did a couple was it a couple of years ago now that they did that they could just do it again um and it probably won't bother them um that much at least for a you know a market the size of australia um and uh it'll be interesting to see how the australian government responds to this too look uh, i've got mixed feelings about this i always thought it was a dodgy deal to start with and and really quite ridiculous you know the the fact it, it's very old world thinking 
that the media companies should be compensated by Facebook, you know, just because they're putting their news up on the Facebook platform. So on that level, I, I think uh, it was, you know, they were pretty lucky to get the deal once, <laughs> you know, uh, and I'm not surprised they're not getting the deal a second time. On the flip side, you know, that doesn't mean I'm any friend of Facebook or uh, Zuckerberg here. I think, you know, the reality is is if, if Facebook wants to say that there's no value in news, even though they built that platform off the back of taking news and republishing, you know, that's fine. I think if that's the way they want to play, then the Australian government should just instantly make them liable for anything published on that platform. You know, yeah. I don't know why the users should be liable when Facebook is basically the, the basis for, you know, the hate speech we see and, and so many other wrongs. Uh, it'd be the simplest way to get Facebook to listen. And, uh, you know, it'd be an inconvenience maybe, you know, maybe I wouldn't be getting cheap stuff off Marketplace anymore, but it'd be a price I'd be happy to pay to make Facebook, uh, you know, responsible to um, people socially outside of outside of their country. Mm, absolutely. And uh, as an abstract analogy, I heard it referred to, um, you know, like, tech companies in general are probably ahead of most governments in terms of uh, regulation in terms of because governments aren't uh, are a bit slow in terms of trying to figure out how to regulate them etc and there was an analogy made to um like oil barons of um you know last century being ahead of um the government in terms of being able to secure as much uh, profit that they could and whatever they you know by whatever means necessary and it might just be another case that you know this might be a minor example of that but that you know a social media company of that size just um you know can you know effectively pull the strings until i guess regulation catches up with them well you're right and as interesting as a footnote there's no reason that the rest of the world couldn't employ the same legislation that the US is using against TikTok <laughs> to, to Facebook. That would be something else that I would really enjoy. You know, like <laughs> Facebook having to set up a wholly owned Australian subsidiary where all the tax stays in Australia and they pay people directly in Australia from the revenue they're earning. I would love to see that. <laughs> absolutely, absolutely. All right, the uh, the last topic here, um, uh, just is re in relation to um, uh, to cinema ticket prices. But before I get into that, um, I was watching an ad um, just this morning um, that was actually shot in four by three, which is unusual these days. It's usually sixteen by nine, given we all have widescreen TVs. And um, the th the only reason this caught my eye is because it was very cinematically well framed. Like I was like, I it actually stopped me. I completely ignored whatever the ad was about and was just stunned at um like the uh, the composition of every shot in the ad kind of reminded me of um uh you know kubrick's work because i think the shining and um uh eyes wide shut in particular was shot um at least whether it was four by three or i think it was one uh, i can't remember what the aspect ratio was close to that sort of squarish frame that, um, you know, isn't typically used, you know, for cinematic presentations. Kubrick was a master and, um, you know, a lot of the shots in Eyes Wide Shut are just, you know, it's worth watching that film just for the imagery because um, it's just so well composed for that type of odd um, odd frame. But just thought I'd mention that because um, it was interesting that, um, I don't know, like, you, you, I guess there was a you know, wannabe Kubrick um, cinematographer on that ad, which is unusual for, you know, an ad in general, really. <laughs> well, it's interesting. I wonder what the thinking was. I mean, 4 by 3 obviously works very well on a phone. So uh, if it's posted on the socials, uh, I'm not sure you'll get the composition because of the small uh, representation. But uh, it means it's a dual-use ad and... Uh, Obviously, somebody who's been to film school and studied Kubrick has shot it. So what's not to love about that? Uh, and and the fact that it would work on a large screen and a, and a small screen equally is probably pretty good as well. So, 
interesting. I'm sure uh, if you Google it, there'll be a whole backstory to that ad, though, that you can interact with and buy more of the the product advertised. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And so just sticking with um, things that are well shot, um, I... Um, very surprisingly found myself in a cinema the other week watching uh, June Part 2. Um, and yes, it's spectacular. And um, a couple of caveats as to why I went. I got a discounted ticket through um, a membership I have. So in other Is words... Is that what it takes? Is that what it takes today, Ben? Um, I, I, didn't, I, I, didn't, I didn't have to pay the full $25 fee um, to get in. So um, that was obviously a contributing factor. Um, and I also had the sneaking suspicion that the film itself would actually remind me of... Um, you know what the types of films i used to like and it definitely did because it felt like i'd been transported back to you know the 90s or the early 2000s and it was like oh yeah this is what cinema is supposed to do kind of thing so great film and it's worthy of all the um accolades it's getting um but there is a disturbing trend um obviously this was in canada but um you know i just made a joke about how expensive the ticket price was and how i wouldn't have gone if i was paying full price for it but this idea that um just for individual films in particular if there's a sense that um in this case june part two had its ticket prices raised just because it was june part two and there was a lot of interest in it in other words to gouge um the uh the cinema goer for uh, for more revenue um that's again like this is another reason why i wouldn't I, i'm losing i've lost interest in cinema because it's getting to this level where they're trying to like squeeze um blood out of a stone um and try and extract as much cash as possible it's not to say that that's not the hasn't always been the been the intention but i just thought that the um balance was a bit better in the past um, when it came to this sort of thing well we've seen it before i guess with back to the future two and three and i think even kill bill one and two and so 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 at hollywood someone's thinking back and you know looking at these ways that they can connect films and uh extract uh maximum uh you know uh, ticket price i guess but it, it's fantastic to hear that it's shot well and it's the sort of cinema you enjoy i mean uh it probably sounds like i'd better go and watch it uh, <laughs> but not I, without I but, need, but but not without watching june part one of course uh, I, I think i can watch that at home and then i'll uh, go and enjoy uh, june part two in the cinema <laughs> i might even pay full price yeah, I haven't read the original book, but um, from what I've, uh, I guess, uh, read now, and I should probably go and read the original book, it sounds like they stuck pretty close to the book itself, which is obviously always handy when they actually stick to the source material. There were apparently a couple of um, big changes that they did, but again, you know, transition to um, the big screen, some things have got to happen and, you know, that people have just got to live with that one interesting uh little side note was uh, just reading up in, in my reading about that um that uh, frank herbert had apparently wanted to sue george lucas for copyright infringement on star wars because if you actually have a look at you know june's story there are some similarities with star wars in there that um, are quite interesting once you actually have them pointed out to you but they are very different stories and you know star wars is obviously the feel good you know good guys beat bad guys kind of uh, scenario whereas june's a lot more nuanced essentially what i thought was refreshing about it was that essentially it's saying that in the process of um becoming the hero and um you know taking you know avenging injustice and taking down the bad guys you end up becoming the villain yourself which i thought was um which i thought was quite highbrow for a hollywood film let's just put it that way <laughs> well, yeah, but remember it wasn't written in hollywood so if it's true to the book you know so it, it's interesting you say that uh all up you know i i get the similarities between june and star wars but having said that i can think of probably another three or four sci-fi stories that, that he could have accused lucas of, of borrowing from Maybe he was the original and everyone else copied him. Who knows? Yeah, <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right, Steve, we might wrap it up there. Um, and, uh, yeah, everyone, go check out um, those June films. They're, uh, they're worthy uh, of, uh, of watching, but, but not at full price. So let's just put it that way. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Alrighty, so um, uh, that's it uh, for this week's episode. Um, we're actually going to be off for a couple of weeks, but um, we'll be back uh, uh, hopefully by around mid-April. So um, that'll be it for today, and we'll catch you next time. <laughs>